Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, here we are about to start our fourth lecture for the Parsons series this fall. Uh, I'm here to welcome Jessica Wexler, uh, and I will give you a little bit of information about her before we begin. Uh, as with all of our lectures, please uh, mute, mute yourself as you're coming in. And uh, I'm super excited. Uh, Jessica is not only an alum, but also a friend, a friend of the, the communication design folks here for a very, very long time. Um, she's a design educator and graphic designer based in New York City. Uh, in 2013, she established the Collaborative Studio Workshop Project as a space for reimagining design pedagogy as a form of professional practice. From 2006 to 13, she maintained an independent design partnership, Greenblatt Wexler, focused on print and screen based projects for art related and cultural institutions. Uh, she is currently uh, at Pratt Institute. Prior to her appointment there, she was an assistant professor and the coordinator of graphic design at Purchase College. And her perspective on design education is informed by a decade of teaching, design curricula, and coordinating faculty. Uh, within diverse public, private, and for-profit institutions. And Jessica, what is your current role at Pratt? It's just not written into this. I'm thing. the chairperson of undergraduate communications design. Chairperson of undergraduate communications design. So with, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica and thank you for coming. Uh, it's so nice to hear from you today. Yeah, thank you so much, Juliet. Um, so I'm Jessica. And um, I currently chair Pratt's undergraduate communications design department. And I'll talk about that a little bit, or talk about it a lot, I guess, at the end, um, closer to the end. Um, it's a big department um, and it has really informed and changed the way that I think about design education. Um, but before I get started, I just want to say I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share my path in, into and through communications design. I just want to thank Brandon and Juliet for inviting me. Um, thank the department at Parsons for hosting this lecture series. Um, as much as possible, I'm going to try and disclose what's real about me to you. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, I wanna let you know that speaking about my work always makes me cry. It's full of emotion and care and pride and fear and hurt and excitement for me. I almost always feel like an imposter. I'm almost always terribly excited and nervous. I steal slides from myself. I iterate, I repeat myself. So most of the slides today are from other talks. And I'm gonna share my screen, but for those of you who are um, not watching this via recording, but are here with me live, um, I'm gonna ask that you like make my slides a little bit smaller um, so that you can still see my face when I'm talking, um, if you wish. My slides tend to be images of what it feels like on the inside of me, um, what my work feels like to me, there for pleasure, for my pleasure, um, and for disclosure. But they show very little about what the bulk of my work actually looks like, um, which is a lot closer to conversations, um, spreadsheets, and emails. Okay, so with that, I'm going to share my screen. Awesome, I see a thumbs up. So it seems impossible for me to imagine a time before I knew as much as I do know now about the utopia dystopia of art and design education. And it's impossible to imagine a time before I knew how deeply I cared about design education, um, which makes me cringe to say that a little bit. It's very earnest. I'm very earnest. Um, it's very true that I care that much. Design education is uh, the thing that pulls me across the room. Uh, I think about it all the time. 
it's woven into my life in a thousand different ways. Um, it's endlessly interesting to me and relevant and important and meaningful and banal and arcane and wrong. Um, it's a passion project for me, for sure, for better or for worse. Uh, I have a BA in religious studies. I didn't start in art school. Um, and when Brendan uh, emailed me and was like, oh, could, you know, as an alum, and I was like, oh, I'm not an alum. I don't really think of myself as an alum of Parsons. I don't even really think of myself as an alum of Haverford College, which is where I got my BA, but I am, of course. Um, In any case, I'll, I'll get to my associate's degree in just a second, but I have a BA in religious studies. Um, and I see now that I could have gone to divinity school. Um, I could have gone into a career in social work. There is a parallel universe for sure in which I'm a Jungian analyst working around and inside to reveal narrative structures, symbolic and psychological structures. Um, but there was no one to point that out to me at the time. Um, what I could see in 1997 after graduating with my BA was taking over the family business, um, which was a cafe, an international newsstand um, with periodicals and newspapers and journals from around the world um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I could see living in New Mexico um, and sunsets and um, summer storms in the afternoon. Um, and I certainly didn't imagine that my interest in iconography, which was what, at the heart of, of how I approached my, my bachelor's in, in religious studies, um, that that interest would return in different forms and that there would be a through line, um, that I would be a through line um, in my career. And I also didn't realize at the time that the world of publication design um, would be one that I would participate in as opposed to just sell or arrange on the shelves. At some point I was living in New Mexico and I was like, okay, so is this it? Is this what you're gonna do? You're good at this. You love your family. Your family wants you to do this. It's beautiful here. Um, I'm really good. No, yes, I'm really good at like knowing what I want and I'm really bad at giving myself permission to do what I want. <laughs> um, I didn't realize that would be a through line, um, but it is. And at that moment I chose to move to New York um, and then like basically was in like some pretty yuck jobs. Um, banking on not my intellect, not my interest, um, but the things that I do because I come from a family of, of small businesses. Like I'm, I'm good at customer service. Um, I, I can clean a bathroom. Like, um, I keep books, I'm, I'm good at math. Um, I like math, I'm well organized. Um, and, and I'm reliable. So I was banking on that and I was doing office manager jobs. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I, I found myself um, working at an interior design, small architecture and interior design studio. I, I was like always sort of like creative adjacent. I didn't even, I don't think I like even like noticed that, that I was like 
working at these like uh, design related places, media production related places. I, I, I was just like there as a kind of administrator. I'm also I'm an administrator now. We'll, we'll get to that. But like, um, I I like I had a kind of like breakdown. I like was like on a bench outside of like an Upper East Side like brownstone where we were doing some sort of renovation project, and I was like, it was winter, and I was sitting on the on the bench, and I just like I like woke up from a stupor like two hours later, and I was like, I am do not want to do this, and I do not know what I'm gonna do next. And it's hard, this is hard. I'm having a hard time, I'm not doing well. And my best friend at the time, and this sounds so flaky, but it's not flaky, it's very earnest. Uh, my best friend at the time, her soon to be husband was getting his associate's degree at Parsons in graphic design. And she was like, well, maybe you wanna do that. <laughs> and I was like, maybe. Okay, um, and, and I did the application and, you know, if I didn't hate Manhattan mini storage so much, then maybe I would like throw up a slide um, with, with, with that gem of an application. Um, but I applied and I got into the associates program. Um, and it was a crossroads in my life. It could have gone a lot of different ways. I could have moved back to New Mexico. Um, I know now that I always wanted to teach, um, but I wasn't gonna allow myself to do that or, or, or something was in the way from me like having a straight path there. Um, and, you know, I didn't love my time at Parsons. I didn't like agree with all of my professors. In fact, some of them, like, I, I was like, I don't know. I really don't know. And, and I don't like the way they're talking about, I don't like the way they're talking about things. And I don't care about selling things to clients. And, and, and I already try and get things like perfect and exact. And I don't know if that feels so good to me um, as, a, as a career. But regardless of whether or not I loved every part of it, it like introduced me to something that I wasn't expecting and which I like kind of started to love. And I had a couple of, of faculty members in the department who had gone to RISD and I didn't know anything about RISD then. Now I do, now I know about their program. And I'm like friendly with like many of the like awesome like educators are there, but then I, it's just, you know, it's just a name. Um, and they were like speaking about design in a slightly different way. And I was like, oh, there's like multiple perspectives. There's like different things and different ways of, of this thing, graphic design. And like, I don't know why, but I have a like sneaking suspicion, I love it. Even though I was having the experience in some of my classes where like the professional application of my skills towards a portfolio was like, it wasn't, it, it wasn't the best fit for me. Um, so I got an internship. I was remembering this. I got an internship at the Gonsfeld, which I think at the time, maybe, and certainly I know that I like teach students now who would think that was great. And I was, you know, you know, I was like an intern I was like designing a postcard and it took me like three weeks to design this postcard because that's where my typographic skills were. You know, I wasn't moving fast. Um, and like, at some point I was doing this and I was like, oh, wow, I, I do not like this. I don't like, I don't like, I don't, this is not like for me, like, I, I don't, it's, this is not exciting to me. Um, and so I was like, well, okay, let's go farther. Let's, let's get an MFA, right. Instead of, um, of being like, oh, you know, I don't love this. Um, let's turn away. I decided to kind of just like go deeper. Um, Cause I had this sneaking suspicion that this thing, this career, this field, it was like bigger. And, and that there would be pockets of space for me and for my, like, my love of it. 
and for the, the sort of the possibility that I imagined it had for me in my life. So when I went, I went to CalArts, I got my MFA in CalArts, I returned home to California and from the West, it's like the West is a really, really important narrative for me and my family, many generations um, out in the West. Um, so I went home, get my MFA. I didn't want to be on the East Coast anymore. I was like, I have to go home to get this, this thing, this special thing that I wanted, which was this um, to explore this interest that I had. And, you know, the, the kind of legacy of, or maybe you don't know, um, what I know is, is, is education now. And what I know now is the legacy of CalArts is one of formal criticality, where like form making um, is in, uh, fused with a critical perspective. And this was a really good fit for me. Um, this, this kind of matched me and I made a lot of stuff. I, I, I met people. I'm sure that I was like really annoying. Um, probably like talked about myself as if I was an artist and, and I don't know, did projects on things that I knew nothing about very confidently, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, it was a wonderful time. It was um, an exhausting time. And, uh, and I decided afterwards, and I guess what I thought was like a pretty like standard thing, a standard dream, which was like, okay, I'm going to open my own independent studio. Open. I'm going to have like a studio or just really interesting work. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be formal. Um, it's going to be about art. It's going to be about culture. Um, and I did that for a little bit. And um, you can see some of my thesis work here and posters I did and websites we did and publications we did. There's Michael. Uh, Michael Greenblatt was my friend from my from undergraduate. He too had like found his way into design. Um, he had gotten his MFA at Yale and we thought, great, we're gonna like combine our superpowers. We're gonna open this into this small studio. Um, and I guess sort of right off into the sunset um, of like every graphic design dream we had. And, and like no one at the time told me that like I wouldn't be able to like sustain a living. Like I, I wouldn't be able to like make enough money doing that. Or that the kind of work that I was going to need to do, the kind of ways of developing the business um, that I was going to need to engage in in order to support myself and Michael and like our respective like families and lifestyles was going to be like much closer to running the family business than I ever wanted to be. You know, like I had moved away from that. I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to do that. Um, and this was like a terrible heartbreak because, you know, this was this dream that, you know, like my dear best, still best friend and I had, and like, it was something we like poured our hearts into. Um, and it was something that he very much wanted. And it became clear that it was something that I did not want. So one of the things I was doing while I was like not making enough money at the studio, but making really, I, I still think like lovely work that feels connected to visual interests that Michael and I shared um, was that I had started to teach. Um, and one of the things that I know now, but again, no one told me <laughs> was that uh, independent studio practice in New York and Los Angeles and, and many other places too is really directly tied to academia. Like people need to make a steady income. And like, if you wanna have a studio that, that explores fun topics or that works with like not-for-profits and less arts and cultural institutions, then you like, you gotta need to supplement your income somehow. And many designers that I knew were doing that through teaching. And I started doing that as well. And 
after one semester of teaching at Otis, I had moved back to Los Angeles. I moved a lot then. I moved as a way to try and get closer to something I wanted because I didn't know how to, how to do it while I was standing still. Um, I was like, oh shit, I really like this. Like, this is like, like all of a sudden I was like, oh, like in client meetings, I was some sort of like weird version of myself. I was like, oh, and here's, here's the thing that we made. Like, I was like really not myself. And in the classroom, I was connecting with students. I was um, really challenged. I was learning just a ton about my own education. And I was like really happy. Like I was, I was home. So I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Of course, on the inside, you know, like on the inside, I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm with my best friend. I have this studio. That's what you have to do. But you love teaching. Also, you're only a part-time teacher. You're not going to, you don't have enough money to just teach, even though that's what you want. What does it look like to just teach? I don't know. Like I had all of this like anxiety and I was like, okay, I got to sit down and have a conversation with Michael. It didn't go well. We didn't speak for a really long time, <laughs> maybe a year. Um, and I started applying for full-time teaching jobs. Why am I telling you so much like uh, personal editorial? Um, because a career is not always what it looks like from the outside. Like if, if you sit me down in some other version of myself, I'm like, well, I got my associate's degree and then I got my master's degree and then I started teaching and then I got a full-time teaching job and now I chair a giant department. It sounds so like, you know, like a foregone conclusion. Like it was like, like it was a straight path, but it wasn't. That's not what it felt like. Um, it felt like tortured and like there weren't any role models and like, it wasn't okay. It wasn't okay what I wanted. Um, it wasn't okay what I was good at. That was weird. No one just teaches. No one just teaches in graphic design, by the way. This is an old thing. Like, you, you can't get tenure at an institution if you just teach. Everyone's like, you're not relevant unless you're doing a lot of other things out in the world outside of this institution. And I see the value of that, you know. Um, but but I, I like had this like really intense interest. Um, like really intense. Like all, like I talked about graphic design all the time. Like, like maybe my partner would be like, shut up. I don't want to talk about design education anymore, Jessica. I don't want to talk about your thoughts on design education anymore or your coworkers or the structure of the department or the budgetary structures or the admission structures, right? I don't want to talk about it. Um, but I had a friend that did and her name is Yasmin Khan. And I met her while I was at KelArts and we talked together at Otis. And she, she also had this like really intense interest. Um, and we figured out, I, I got a full-time job. Um, she didn't, she still doesn't have one actually. She's a part-time educator. Um, I got a full-time tenure track position at SUNY Purchase. I moved back to New York for that. Um, I eventually stayed there for six years and got my tenure. Um, but about halfway through my time there, I was like, okay, I'm, I, can't, I can't even fake this client work anymore. I just, I don't give a shit, I don't care. I don't care if I make another book. All I wanna do is talk about design education. And she and I sort of like announced to the world, otherwise known as like ourselves, like over the phone, she lives, she lives in California. We were like, we're gonna do this thing. Like we're gonna, we're gonna have a pedagogical practice. That's what we're gonna call it. And it's, it's gonna be all about teaching um, and about our ideas about teaching. Um, and this felt like, being free. Um, and uh, 
in 2013, we started filling Google Docs with ideas. We started saying yes to um, offers to teach workshops um, at different institutions. We started writing syllabi and projects that um, sort of addressed some of the larger issues and ideas that we had. And we started with this sort of core set of questions. The first one being like, well, what does one teach in contemporary graphic design curricula? Like one of the sort of driving factors of me and Yasmin's obsession is that we're like not teaching the things we should be teaching. There's like a miss. And like, where are all the people that want to talk about that? Where are all the people that want to like talk about what we should be teaching and like how it's impossible to know because graphic design itself, and I'll use the term graphic design because that's the term that was used in my education, but you can think of it as synonymous with communication design. I teach in communication design, I've taught in communication arts, names change, right? And, and the trend in our field is that name changes, names change to like point to a larger umbrella, right? It used to be like really specific what we did. And now like there's many, many ways. And there's many ways in which education doesn't support this. Um, we don't do a good job yet. Um, sometimes we do, but not always. And, and that's okay. Um, but anyways, we have this like central question, like what are we gonna teach? And then like, how do we um, formalists like, people who love form making, um, people who love like beautiful surfaces and like visual, like plenty. How do we exist in this context um, of, of design education, which is like a fairly aformal environment. Um, and we didn't really know what to do. You know, we were like, okay, we have this pedagogical prop, you know, practice. So says us in our hearts, in our minds, how are we going to let people know that we're doing this awesome thing? You know, this is literally what we're talking about at 3 a.m. She had just had her second child. I had had my first son. We were up at weird, crazy hours. You know, like that's how you know that you've got a passion. You're like uh, talking about graphic design education at 3 a.m. Um, or like in between feedings or like while you're walking in the grocery store. Um, and so we decided that we were going to start hacking like the things that educators make we're like well, what does educate what, what do educators make like let's let's make it a project how would we teach students to do it how do you make something out of nothing right and so we started to break it down we're like okay well one of the things we make are these applications for full-time positions like educators are always applying to different schools um again something no one tells you about you just like find out about it. you know like why doesn't anyone tell you about it i don't know anyways i'm telling you it's, we apply to a lot of things so we started making these applications to institutions and sending them off, even if we weren't going to get the job because we weren't going to move to that place. And they were manifestos, right? They were uh, what we started to think of as forms of critical writing, ways of articulating our thoughts, a reason, a timeline, a deadline. Um, and, you know, we like, we got, we got ourselves a website. We got ourselves all the things, you know, like a website an Instagram account and blah, you know, we just started making things, started talking about it. Like we were doing it. Like I was, did an AIGA lecture. And I was like, I'm doing this now. Um, you know, this thing I do over the phone at 3 AM and inside of Google Docs. And we got it into our head that, the form, the platform that that was going to be a good fit for us was that we were going to do workshops. Um, and that these workshops were going to be for educators because no one taught us how to teach graphic design. We taught ourselves. Um, I got really lucky. I got so lucky. I was hired at Otis by Callie Nikitas. I'm forever grateful for her this who was a new chair there. And she kind of hired a lot of CalArts women like myself. And we like, we like collaborated. Like we did everything together. We wrote the entire four year curriculum and then we threw on a grad curriculum together. Like we wrote it during breaks. 
We wrote it in the classroom while we were teaching it. We were iterating and creating community and building this. And it was like a wonderful four years. Um, it was a wonderful four years. I haven't ever found that again. That's not actually how most places are. Um, it's tough out there for educators. There's not a lot of community. And like, I'll, I'm the first one to say, you know, like not a lot of people agree with me. Like, I work with plenty of people who don't like what I have to say about graphic design, or they think I'm running it into the ground. Um, it's, it's not a fun loving place, always. Um, art and design education for the educator. Um, not like to say like, oh, woe is us or anything. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that it's like not always a very supportive space for, for ideas that are in process. Um, I do think that's changing. Um, so anyways, we decided we're gonna make these, we're gonna make these workshops, we're gonna be for educators. And, um, and uh, okay, we're just gonna put out an open call and like email it around. Um, and we didn't know, like we didn't know if anyone was gonna come. Callie was like, you can use Otis in the summer. Like we decided that we would make it free. Um, a side note would be like, do, do I have a problem valuing my work? Yes. Is that why I do it for free? Maybe. Um, but also free felt right. Like free felt like what we were going for. Um, free at every level, right? And so we put out this open call um, and, and people came. Um, and we wrote a syllabus a giant syllabus and it was the first of three we've done three workshops over the last five years um and our syllabi uh which you can find on our website work, workshopproject.wiki um are are something that we think of as a form of critical writing um a way of articulating and synthesizing what we're thinking about, um, a way of pointing to a future for design educators where we are not problem solving and we are not teaching problem solving, but we are inquiring and engaging with the now, um, with what is put in front of us, um, this contemporary culture that we are imagining new futures. Um, and that we are uncovering and revealing opaque structures so that we might move more freely inside of them and so that our students might have more agency in the world. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of every workshop, we'll deliver our syllabus as a keynote. Um, we have a very sort of self-selecting group of educators who join us. Um, and like, I'm biased, but I think that it is a kind of buffet of the most innovative um, and generous um, and like fantastical educators working in design today. Um, we have former students that join us. We partner with institutions for each one. Our first one was at Otis. The second one was at CCA um, in San Francisco. And the third one was with CalArts. So we always have a cohort of graduate students who joins us, who are usually like, uh, what do you, don't, don't tell me that you don't know exactly what you're doing. What do you mean you don't know exactly what you're doing? You're supposed to be our teachers. You're supposed to know exactly what you're doing so you can tell us, um, which is always really fun. And, um, and they are moments of community. Um, they are an antidote 
to what in art and design education can become rote, um, stuck, bureaucratic, repetitive. Um, and I'm, I'm not hating on it. I mean, that's, that's where I, that's my context. That's where, that's where I live. That's where I thrive. Um, but the free workshops are a space for educators to imagine new possibilities because we believe that if you make space for that imagining, you will be able to bring that back into your syllabus. You will bring that back into the classroom. You will bring that back to the future of, of design. You will, you will bring that feeling um, of having community, of being supportive, supported of, of laughing and of making something together. Designers are I, in my, in at least my generation, right? Xer, um, are terrible collaborators, terrible, terrible. Um, we know that designers need to collaborate, but the truth is I was taught to make design like in a cubicle by myself, right? Me and my ideas like my, my special, special ideas, <laughs> like working so hard to try and like give them form. Um, but mostly what I do in my life is work with others. Um, and that's hard because we don't all agree. Um, and this is especially true of educators. So it's been a great privilege, um, this aspect of my practice, which has led me to be able to spend time with these people who I respect and love, um, many of whom are probably some of some of um, your faculty. We love a group shot. Um, I thought I was earnest. We are. Um, it's not a cool kids club. Um, I like to think it's cool looking. <laughs> I like the way they look. Um, but it's a real, it's a little, it's, it's about being together and it's amazing. Uh, this is a shot of a group photo um, of us in hubs. Our last free, free three um, was, took place um, in Mozilla hubs. And this was our group shot on the stairwell to nowhere. Um, I just can't believe that people come and that they work so hard um, imagining projects and curricula and structures that may seem impossible or may be impossible at their current institution, but which are not in fact impossible. And the seeds of which can grow um, in, in the tiniest little ways um, and that you can take those back to your institution. It's the free, so we depend on the like generosity of institutions. Um, we depend on those relationships that we have. Um, we partnered with hackers and designers for our first one. We always partner with someone um, who adds to our skill set. It's like a big part for me and Yasmin. Like we don't want to just be the only ones. It's not about us. It's a partner. Um, and hackers and designers made an awesome wiki for us. Um, which provides structure for the websites. It collects and documents um, and is a way for us to be together when we're not, um, but a way for us to like document um, and engage with each other when we're together. Um, the wiki changes for each workshop um, and always holds the syllabus as well as the full breakdown of what people do every day. Um, we break things down just the way we break things down for students in our classrooms. So we really ask faculty educators to come along for the ride, right? Like come along for the ride, like get on board. We'll take you somewhere. Trust us. Um, this is what we want you to be thinking about. Um, so it's less about like everyone's personal agenda and more about coming together around central themes. Um, each of our syllabi um, states meta considerations, a uh, larger sort of like cultural critique, um, readings, 
that we want people to engage with. Um, a couple of years ago, we were thinking a lot about how we, we were no longer gatekeepers as educators. Um, recently, we've been talking, thinking about hollow buy-ins and blockchains as ways of informing new structures for design curricula. Um, we've been thinking a lot about burnout. It's been a tough couple of years in education. And I'm sure that all of you know that as well um, in the classroom, um, in administration, all around. Um, we used to meet in person. We hope that we will again, which is kind of what it looks like. Um, more recently, um, we met in virtual space. We didn't know how that was going to work, but it was actually kind of fantastic and amazing and just the same. Um, and we make things. Like that's the, that's the thing. Nobody leaves without making a thing. Um, we make the things so that we can uncover the ideas and we can push them forward in some way. Here's everyone gathered. Um, Here's us watching some of the groups of faculty who have collaborated present. So I talked about a crossroads with my associates and I talked about this kind of like articulation of like, whoa, okay, I'm gonna go for this thing, this educator thing, like that's my thing, I'm gonna go for it. Um, uh, I guess I'm going to trust myself. I guess I think I'm good at it. Um, well, in 2017, I like, you know, like turned up the volume a little bit <laughs> by applying for and then like getting the chair position at, at Pratt. Um, and it's a it's a big shift moving into administration after being in the classroom. If you think of the classroom as a space where everything is possible, you can think of, of infinite potential um, through interactions with, with students um, and as large groups. Uh, this administrative space is one of impossibility. N nothing can change in that space. And so what do you do if nothing can change? And what do you make? Um, and so also once you become an administrator, the educators you work with, they start to, to like low key hate you. <laughs> They're kind of joking, but it's sort of true. You like become the boss and then people talk to you differently. Um, and you have different concerns because you're looking at this giant thing from a bird's eye view. And that's really different from how it looks when you're inside the classroom. Um, and this has been the space that I've been in most recently for the last five years. And I still ask the same questions, like how do I design, edu design education? How do I, how, I'm a formalist, how do I live here? Like my life looks like this, it looks like this, it, it looks like this, this is this, this is my day-to-day -day life. Um, but this is like the inside of me, right? Like my values, my work, reordering hierarchies in design education, uh, working towards curricular structures that are fluid and responsive and nimble, finding and making space for change, um, modeling collaboration, modeling collaboration with the office team, modeling it with, with, with my colleagues and peers, trying to um, make room for dialogue, when there's no time and space from change, when there's will or no will, um, invisible structures is my work. Um, and oh man, like I, gosh, now what I know about design education 
um, what I wish I didn't know. Um, our workshops have changed um, from a sort of point of view that's specifically about curricula, the content of curricula and structure for projects to engage more with questions around administrative structures, the way schools are structured, departments are structured, the way admissions works, asking questions about what the relationship of the educator is to the institution, what it should be, what it might be, what our responsibility is and vice versa. And my goal really um, in my work at, at Pratt but also with workshop project is to build a collaborative and iterative discourse around design education through making. Um, I've never found educators conferences to be a particularly good fit for me. I mean, I find them interesting, but I don't, I don't feel particularly connected to academic, more academic forms of writing um, or more, uh academic forms of those sort of traditional um conferences or academic activities um and part of my work at workshop project is is building new pathways for different types of conversations um different ways of thinking about making that aren't simply are not simply that um different ways of thinking about making that aren't about a kind of commercial application um, that are about applying these these ways of, of making and thinking back into the classrooms and to our educational structures themselves. Um, what I didn't know when I started out, but which I do know now, is that all pedagogical problems are wicked problems. I won't solve anything. I won't fix anything. Um, and that is a really fascinating context um, and one that I fully embrace. Um, where is the space we can move in that? Where is the change that we make in that? Um, Another thing maybe sometimes people don't tell you is that chairs have specific contracts, like all sorts of things about like academia and like, you know, like ways that contracts are like, I'm at home today. It's like my research day. I'm like, a, uh, you know, like I'm the way my contract is worked out is that I have like a certain number of days that I, that I'm sort of working for Pratt. And then I have like this, this day where I'm like working towards, I guess, my own relevance <laughs> um, my research day. Anyways, um, it's true about my contract now that I'm almost at um, sort of standard term at Pratt is six years, three years and a three year renewal. Um, I'm in my fifth year being a leader doesn't look what I thought it looked like, would look like holding my authority where it comes from, the types of authority people want me to perform, um, how I want to spend my time, where I can make the most change. These are all questions that are like really thrashing around inside me. Um, I'm like, yet again, I'm on like the eve, I can feel it, I can feel it in my bones and I don't know what the answer is and I don't know which way it will veer. Um, but there's a new path that I can't yet see and I'm gonna have to make very soon. And I mentioned that because I think that's really real and a part of what it is to build a career, to make a career, 
you know, we have so much mythology about like, gosh, the career, building a career, so much mythology about the, the grand narrative and moving up and moving up and moving higher and advancing. And, um, and like, I just like want to say that it doesn't feel like that. It feels like every so often, and I, I have to make a path out of nothing. Um, it's of course not out of nothing. It's driven by my passion. It's driven by my experience, um, but it's open. It's not a foregone conclusion. Um, and that's terribly exciting. And I'm with, I'm with you in that. Um, I mean, your students, um, I don't know exactly where you are on your path, but we're with you too, um, especially in this field that we're in, which is so marvelously huge um, with all of these, that is becoming, our field is becoming as we speak. Um, okay, I'm looking at the time. I over-talked. I usually over -talk. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now and open the chat for any questions. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And yes, if you have, if you all have any questions, you can, of course, put them in the chat. Uh, or if you want, you can unmute and just speak them out loud. Um, and usually, usually I'm the one who starts with a question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, well, maybe, maybe actually, uh, I don't know. We're, we're in crazy times uh, anyway over here. I may as well go ahead and ask, what, do you, what, do you, what did you learn about design education that you wish that you didn't know? Oh. Um, it's just us. <laughs> There's no one smarter than us. <laughs> Here we are. It's us. Like no one's coming to save us. <laughs> um, no one's got all the answers. It's us. Um, and in a pandemic, um, and when you feel so much responsibility and care towards everyone in the community of the school, uh, it's hard. It's like an existential thing. Um, you're like, oh, it's just me. <laughs> and, and, I, and I need to stand up and I need to make those decisions and, and I need to collaborate and I need to take ownership of this and show up. Um, that's, I, I think that was hard. That's hard. Okay, so here's, here's our, our uh, first question. How long did it take you before deciding to go to graduate school from your second degree? Do you find it valuable to take time between going to different programs? And for that matter, I, I'm gonna, I might just tack on to that. Uh, because uh, we get this question from students often, graduate school, like, is that something, who, who should go to graduate school? Okay, um, so it was terribly important for me to go to, for me to take time off between my BA and my associates. Um, in fact, I put in a couple of applications when I was a senior um, at Haverford, one to Union Theological Seminary, which is also, I can't see where I'm pointing, but I live right across the street from it now. Um, I was like, oh, I wanna to go to Union Theological Seminary. Um, very, very, very badass seminary. Um, very cool. Um, and I also applied for a history of art program at the University of New Mexico um, in Albuquerque. And like, I didn't get very far with those because like, I felt like I had to do that or I didn't know what to do, but I didn't, it was, uh, it didn't, it was, it was just default. It was really important for me to take that time. Um, I didn't know. 
what I wanted. However, once I took my associate's degree, it was like wildfire. Like I, I wasn't even like done with my associate's degree and I was applying for like my MFA in Cal Arts. I was like, no way, I'm go <laughs> like, I couldn't stop, right? Like I was like, I had to have it. Um, and, and, you know, so I guess I've done it both ways. Both ways were felt, you know, really right at the time. It was more tortured when I was done with my BA because when you're finished with your undergraduate degree, you don't always know like what to do. And sometimes going to school can be something to do. Um, I don't like to give anyone specific advice like that, just to say there's no one way. There's a zillion ways. There's no one way. In fact, I've done multiple ways just myself. Um, so you don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to school to do what we do. You do have to go to school if you want to be an educator. I have to have my degrees to do what I do. But to be a practitioner, you don't. In fact, there's so many ways to practice. You don't have to have a BFA, um, but you're getting one. And the question I think is how can you take the most advantage? Like how can you take most advantage of that? And how can you like feel confident and just sort of hang tight enough to recognize where you really are. Like, do you really know where you're going enough to jump into that other degree? Or is it time to just wait a little bit? Um, you're not gonna get it wrong. There's no wrong way. Other questions? You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Next up, mm. uh, uh, one of the things you said that if a classroom is a place of infinite possibility, then administration is a place of the impossible. As a student, I think administrators hold the potential to make a lot of very impactful change. So I was wondering how you came to develop this perspective and why you think it holds true. Oh, I think administrative change is um, astronomically more powerful than what takes place in any given class classroom. Um, so when I say that, I guess I'm talking about what it feels like on the inside right? Not necessarily the kind of impact it has. Like, uh, I oversee a department of 600 students and over 70 faculty. I schedule 350 courses a year. Um, I have changed uh, a lot of structures that allow for conversation. Um, communication structures, faculty development structures, like curricular discussions, um, even just small things that you do at the administrative level can really ripple out and have huge effect. So when I say that, I'm talking more about what it feels like. The feeling of being in the classroom for me with students is like, Oh, so awesome. It's so amazing to hear from you. It's so inspiring to hear what your interests are. It is inside of my, my, my toolkit. And it is part of like where I live in my work to be able to develop the structures for your inquiry that supports that. But it's a different dynamic as an administrator. Um, and when you're working with peers or colleagues, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a space of infinite possibility. Some of that has to do with budget. Some of that has to do with facilities. Some of that has to do with, um, oh gosh, digital tools, scheduling software, you name it. Like really, really concrete things, which are the meat and potatoes of what I do. Like the change I make is like, it is felt, but it is not seeable, right? Like I see it, the assistant to the chair sees it, my assistant sees it, like we were like, but yes, it has the potential for huge change. But I also, when I say that, 
I also just want to point to that change is epic and that change can happen over scale. And I've been really interested in that. And part of my work at Pratt has been like looking at that and seeing that. But I also want to acknowledge that like, there are transformative moments that happen inside of the classroom just between you and one other person. Like moments of mentorship, moments of connection, moments of projection, right? Like you think something's happening because you see something in me that is actually something fantastically wonderful in you, right? There's, there's, a, there's a like a directness and an intimacy and like a, a potential in the classroom that can happen between a, a faculty member and a student, a teacher and a student, um, two a individuals, student a, student. <laughs> a student and a student. And these are deep, right? They're not wide. The way administration is, they're deep. Um, so, I mean, I'm an optimist. I, I, uh, I am an optimist. Like, I, I, I want to make things better. Uh, that's silly, I guess. Um, I really do. Uh, Doesn't so, that make you a designer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, yes. So, um, I do speak to not a lot but some students and I do recognize and take very, very serious my responsibility um, to think and see the larger whole um, and to encourage and support faculty um, so that they might have more of those moments of connection that can only happen in the classroom. Um, can I speak a little bit more about taking advantage of your education BFA? Yes. You know what I did throughout all of my education because I was just like kind of an asshole as I was like, I know better. I know better. No, no, maybe I'll change it. That's not my idea. Yeah. That I had some things to work out, you know, I, I had some defense mechanisms. I had some, some, some things to work out in terms of how to own my voice, how to, how, to, how to locate myself. And some of that like played out in terms of how I responded to the prompts that were put in front of me. Maybe this could never happen, but in hindsight, and I certainly work like with students in the, in, as, an, as an educator being like, okay, let's acknowledge that and let's put it aside. Because what we're here to do is like voraciously try on new things. Like voraciously be like, okay, really? I don't know that I wanna do that. I don't know that I ever thought that I would be doing that, but okay. Um, and in order for that to happen, you have to trust the people that you're with. And I guess not all of them are trustworthy. Not all, not all of your faculty members are trustworthy. Um, but it's better to trust them than it is to fight because you'll learn so much more. I would have learned so much more. I had to become a teacher to learn the so much more because I was so unwilling to surrender to the learning, to the fact that other people might have a different perspective, a bigger perspective than I had. And, and that's kind of a humility that I've learned working in education and one that I is, you know, I cannot, I can't say enough about how valuable that is. Great. Well, we're, we're six minutes over. So uh, I just want to say thank you. And thank you all. Thank you all for coming. And uh, a, a big round of applause for Jessica and see, see you all very soon. Ciao.